I'll tell you honestly, I hate being in a wheelchair. You know, I would give anything to have my legs back. Um, yeah. I make Fair most enough. of what I of what I've got left because I, I you know I don't have a choice and I'm absolutely yeah. Alone. So you know, I've done quite a few things. You know, I learned to ski. I started learning to fly a microlight until I crashed it and got banned. <laughs> uh, 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 I got a little bit heavy. I was 16 and a half stone, and the maximum all-up weight for a microlight pilot is 13 and a half stone. And so um, we tried to take off. We didn't. We crashed back down, and I sort of broke it and then got banned until I was light enough. I mean, I, I'm light enough now, but there are so many other things that I'm doing. That Forgive me for viewing me for smiling. Sorry, that's just quite an image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they took me out the microlight and just left me on the runway. And I'm thinking, I hope some plane doesn't come and land now, because they're going to see me sat there and go, ah, oh, some guy's playing chicken in the runway. He'll move. Yeah. He'll move. Yeah. yeah. And land. And he's like, oh, no. I didn't get run over. Um, so, you know, well, with that. Getting back on the bike and uh, scuba diving. I've gone traveling. I've done surfing. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and the skiing again. So it, yeah. it, there, are, there are lots of things that you can do, and I certainly don't sit there and say oh you know my life is useless it's all over it's not it's far from it i do and absolutely as, much as i yeah. used to do and um you know i was a pe teacher so i'm not saying i do more but i do just as much and i have uh, just as much a fulfilling life and an exciting life as i could have ever done as an able bodied person and I mean, despite everything that I do, and I have a great life, um, I, I certainly would have my legs back in, in an instant. And uh, yeah, it, it, it does it does play on your mind every now and then. Okay, fair fair, fair enough. Thanks, thank you for being uh, very honest and open about that. It's just, I, I mean, I'll, I'll just tell the listeners at the beginning before we started doing the recording for the interview. I did ask talent uh how touchy <laughs> the subject yeah. of wheelchair user wheelchair bound not um, wheelchair bound what you not well yes exactly and this is one of the points um and it is a difficult subject to be open about um and thank you for being yeah. very but open about i would it. say that what what I say applies to me because there may be some, well, you may have two people who are the same level of lesion, which is where the spinal cord has been damaged, uh, but we may have two completely separate things. So, for example, right. I get really bad neurogenic pain. So that makes, is, is pain in the brain. I mean, a lot of people have pain in the brains, yeah, and it's brought on by other people, but this is, <laughs> this neurogenic pain and I can describe it as this. It feels as though from the sternum down, I am immersed in boiling water. Uh, but, that's, but that's below the brain. Below the level of my brain, my brain is telling me that I'm immersed in boiling water. And I, you know, I desperately want to get out of that water. Um, wow. And I've also got cramp in my calves and hamstrings. And it feels as though someone is sliding a knife in and out between my lower rib cage mm. and so i take a, a really powerful opiate called tramadol which I tries, heard of that, tries yes. to help and uh, dull down the pain and i take up to 10 tablets a day to try and manage the pain oh, oh talent and i mean a friend of mine slips a disc and people who've done that know how painful that is uh, and they took two tablets a day and were in bed hallucinating and couldn't really do a great deal and so you know that's the amount of medication that i have to take just to cope with the daily pain but then the somebody pain. else same level of lesion will have no pain but then they might have leg spasms mm. so my leg don't spasm but you know they might have that issue so we're all slightly different well that's uh, a good point uh, let's take a break <coughs> excuse me let's take a break Play some music. And when we come back, let's talk about the different levels of disability that you deal with on the bike and how – I'm really fascinated at how you get somebody who has no feeling – has no stomach muscles, for example, no core stability. I'm fascinated as how you do this. Okay.
Welcome back. You're listening to Roger Tewson and my very special guest, Talon Skills Piggins of the Bike Experience here on bikerfm.co.uk just before the break. Uh, Talon was uh, telling us about the various different types of um, how uh, different people react to maybe have the same disability, the same lesion in the spine. Um, I'm sure you are, like me, absolutely fascinated how Talon and his team managed to get somebody with... Uh, as has already been described, no core stability, no control over their stomach or back muscles. How do they get ride a bike around a racetrack? Talent, take it away. How do you guys get somebody out of a wheelchair onto a bike? Um, I believe I've read somebody who's doing 113 miles an hour around Castle Coombe. Well, 130 miles an hour would scare the crap out of me going around Castle Coombe. Uh, I wouldn't. You'd be right. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, ma I okay. managed 154 down Avon Rise. Uh, Although when I hit the brakes, I did actually end up sitting on top of the tank, and I thought I was going to crash. And here we go. <laughs> How do you do it? So you don't thigh muscles. You don't have stomach no. muscles. How is it done? Well, we don't we don't do too much to the bike. That's the main thing. Um, you can just take your bog standard bike, and what we use is old fashioned bicycle toe clips, and the toe clips are attached to the foot pegs. Then we put yeah. Velcro on the toe clips. We then put Velcro on the toe of your motorcycle boot. So the foot rests on the peg, but the Velcro of the toe clip holds the foot in place, and because the toe clip comes over the top, it stops the toe from bouncing off. So that holds, I'm with you, yeah. that holds the foot in place. Okay. Uh, around the tank is a Velcro strap with a little tail. When you get your knee in up against the tank, the tail wraps around the front of your knee and goes on to the Velcro patch where the knee slider would be. So that right. stops the yes. knee from sliding forwards and also the knees from pulling out when you're, you know, doing over 100 miles an hour. Indeed. The third adaption that we have is a clicktronic gear shifter. Now, that's an electronic solenoid which uh, is operated by a thumb switch and that just attaches just above the uh, the gear lever, and a set of thumb switch bars are on the handlebars. And so, so those are the only three things that we do. So when you, when, a, when you want to get on the bike, the bike is on a paddock stand. You wheel up next to the bike. You offer up your leg, and your launch crew help you to sort of get the leg up on top of the saddle. Then you have to put one hand on top of the motorcycle seat. The other hand goes on your wheelchair, and you basically throw your f head down, and at the same time as the head goes down, your backside comes up, and the weight of the leg drags your bum up and over and onto the saddle. You then sort of clamber up and grab hold of the handlebars, um, and then your launch crew will lift and correctly put your feet on the pegs and into the the bicycle toe clips. I hope it, I hope it's not a too facetious a comment, but that sounds like quite an achievement in itself. Um, it sounds a lot harder than it actually is. You know, once you start lifting your weight up, your, the weight of your leg on the other side of the sort of bike really does mm. help swing your backside up and onto the bike. It, it's amazing actually how quick can be done. I mean, the first few times you do it, yeah, it does look a little bit gawky and you are a bit awkward doing it. But, mm. you know, by the end of the day, when people have got used to getting on and off the bike, they're, you know, they're hopping on and they're Velcroed in and ready to go within sort of 30 to 45 seconds. It can be that quick. Mm. Um, so... So you've got your guy sitting on the bike now, the bike, handles the handlebars, all he's all Velcroed in, yeah. everybody's happy, now, just, and you've got your launch crew around yeah. him as well. Just to let you know, the Velcro is strong enough to keep you uh, in place, but not strong enough to hold you should you crash. Right, so you can still separate yeah. from the bike. I have, yeah. I have tested it as the crash test dummy. <laughs> I crashed at Castle Coombe at about 70, 80 miles an hour, and I came away from the bike. I've also gone into gravel traps at Donington and Silverstone a couple of times on track days, and I've come off the bike. So, you know, it, I'm not tying people onto a bike. That would be dangerous, and that would be stupid. Um, I have seen 
YouTube clips from other riders in different countries, and uh, it seems to be de rigueur in the States to actually strap yourself to the motorbike. Uh, you know, uh, I don't like the sound not, of that. <laughs> I do not. I do not put that into anything. No, you you are, you know, you're on the bike, but should the worst happen, you will come away from the bike. So there we go. You're on the bike. You're happy, and then when you're ready to go, um, the one person holds on to the front of the motorbike, one person holds on to the back, and the third member of the launch crew grabs hold of the paddock stand and takes the paddock stand off. You then on two wheels, start the bike up, when you're ready, you put it in first gear, you give a nod to the guy standing, or girl, I must admit, we have had, you know, men and women, launch crew, volunteers, catching, um, they'll move out the way, and so you are simply held by one person at the back of the bike, and then you basically let the clutch out, and you smoothly accelerate, and just like when you and everybody else takes off, from a standing start, your foot is on the ground, but then as soon as you're moving, your foot comes off. And so... And the brain takes over then, doesn't it, you, really? As soon as you're moving, you've got the gyroscopic effects of the wheels turning, and it stabilizes you. And so there's, you know, there's no reason for us to put our feet down, because we're moving and we're going forwards. Because you don't <laughs> run along next to your bike and then jump on it whilst it's moving. You know, you've got your foot on the ground, you accelerate, yeah. your foot comes off. It doesn't go back down on the ground. I imagine that's something that you have to. Um, I, I'm trying to picture myself as somebody who's been involved in an accident. Uh, I've not been on a motorbike in five, ten, fifteen years, or whatever. Yeah, you've got to. Get Is there a certain relearning process? You've got to remind your remind your rider. Yeah. You know how to do this. You've done this a thousand. 10,000 times before when you, your legs were working. Oh, de definitely. I mean, I will be chatting to them all the time when they're sat on the bike and getting ready. I mean, the nerves kick in after, I, after I've after i demonstrated. We then get the riders to come up one at a time. And when I point at the rider and say, right, your turn next, that is generally when they go quiet. Mm 